to it. This week, gentlemen, the name on the marquee has got to be Anatoly Malikin, who this past Friday defeated Rainer de Ritter, becoming the one championship middleweight champion and the first uh, three-weight champ in all of combat sports and all of MMA? Or has that been done first, before by somebody else? First simultaneous three-way champ in, in major promotion history. Yes. Okay. And uh, let's talk about this real quick, the significance of this. Anatoly Malikin, he is the one heavyweight champ, one light heavyweight champ, and one middleweight champ. And he dropped down this past weekend and, and faced uh, Rainer de Ritter and took the middleweight champ from DeRitter. And he also took the light heavyweight championship from DeRitter as well. Mark, start us off. You watch the fight after three rounds, or in the third round, rather. Malikin overwhelms DeRitter and takes the middleweight title as well. What are your thoughts? Yeah, just to clarify quick, I, I didn't realize when you posed it to me that you mentioned all combat sports. I, I know it's first ever in MMA. I couldn't tell you all combat sports there could be others that's what i meant yeah in that regard I, mean. I didn't yeah obviously in boxing there's like eight or nine division True, yeah. champs yeah. yeah but uh yeah anatoly malikin is a cyborg i mean he's just a handful and especially for de who can't really hang with him in, in the striking and he did his best he certainly came into this one with a much better game plan than he did the first fight between the two of them he really did do a decent job of keeping Malikin off him early. He made Malikin work a lot harder for his entries. He found a lot of entries himself into the clinch to, to kind of give himself a chance to find something, which he didn't even, he didn't even really have that chance the first fight. Granted, he never could. He, he couldn't get Malikin down. Um, but even so, he I thought he did well to prevent himself from being cornered and bombarded like Malikin likes to do against the cage. He even dropped Malikin at one point with that little jab calf kick combo that kind of knocked him off balance. That, that was nice to see. Uh, and maybe worst case, he figured like, I'm going to survive into these later rounds. We're going to get into round four. We're going to get into round five and I'm going to see where Anatoly's cardio is at. And then maybe the takedowns are going to come then. And he was kind of on his way to making that game plan work i mean malikin was stepping it up as the fight went, went on in in round two he started to get more and more dialed in some of those swarms started to come body shots dirty boxing he was wearing on on rdr and again I, it seemed like it was going all right for rdr but i guess he was getting worn on way more than it even looked like because then in early round three we get that odd finish where he shoots and, and he gets stuffed and Malikin gets on top. But even then, I'm like, oh, okay, grappling opportunity here for DeRitter. Like, let's see what happens. And yeah, a few punches are landing from Malikin, and the one knee did land. But even the knee didn't seem to affect RDR that much in the moment. And then Malikin decides to separate, separate and stand up, and RDR is just sitting there. And then he doesn't get up <laughs> and it was very weird like you're like wait like that's it he's just he's not going to get up so i can't believe that's how that thing ended it, it didn't there was no like obvious moment for us as fans to be like oh i get it why he's not getting up here you know it was just one of those ones where i guess he really got worn on and he didn't he didn't have much left um so odd finish but either way we as we said we have our first ever simultaneous three division champ in a major promotion. And I know it's one, which isn't too stacked in, in the heavier weight classes. So we have to be fair about that. And also it's a little bit easier with the rehydration in one, because the weight classes are 205, 225 and heavyweight. So everything's a little closer together there. But as much as I'm going to give you those facts, just because they are the facts. And I feel like we, we have to say those things. I'm also going to tell you that it is an incredible achievement either way and that Anatoly Malikin probably deserves more of a spotlight in MMA than he's even getting right now. So huge night for him. Omar, let's bring you in here. What were your thoughts of how this fight plays out with Malikin seemingly overwhelming and accumulating damage on RDR throughout the fight to the point where RDR basically, it's almost like he retires, but that's obviously when it's in the middle of rounds, but it was like he retired during like a, a break in the action. Yeah. He was like, that's, that's right. it. That's all I got. Yeah. He was done. 
I mean, it, the fight didn't go very well for him. It did look like he put a lot more work into his uh, training as far as his body was concerned. He looked like, and I think Mark alluded to it before, he looked much more in shape, uh, much more athletic in general while he was in there. But the problem is, is, is Malikin is a tank, right? Like the, the other thing that I think he's really underrated for is his footwork. His footwork is fucking phenomenal. That dude's has a base under him at all times for the most part. He was off base a couple times here and there uh, after, after uh, DeRitter cut a couple angles. He got, he got caught bull charging, you know, got mad at Dort a little bit, but that was very few and far between. Um, but I think what I really loved about, uh, about his footwork is that he was able to cut off DeRitter in, in almost every regard. There were a few times where DeRitter ended up against the cage, and I don't think he ended up being wanting to be there, let alone even realized that's where he was, but he was kind of lulled into that spot. And DeRitter played a game where he waited a little too much. I think he's, again, relying too much on a takedown on a guy who's very possibly not going to get taken down by you. And pulling guard is a dangerous game against a guy who you know can beat on you from top. And so I just don't think there were a lot of avenues there for DeRitter. And he just looked really uncomfortable in there. Less so maybe than the first round. And I think that had to do more with his physical preparation for that fight. But in the end, man, you know, you can't walk back the entire fight and not suffer the consequences from a cardio perspective, but also from a mental perspective as well. Malikin walked him down the entire fight and just absolutely brutalized him towards the end. To be honest, man, once he got on top, it th- those shots may not have looked like clean, like, you know what I mean? Like, nothing. Those shots look like they sucked. Like, I not necessarily blaming homeboy from being like, you know what? I'm not getting the takedown here. Pulling the gazeve, if you will, right? Can't do much. Call it quits. Okay, here is a question. Well, it's really a question for Mark, but Omar, feel free to contribute as well. So Malikin now, he stays undefeated as a professional. His sixth consecutive win under the one championship banner. So he's now 14-0. and All 14 of his fights, he has won by a finish. Okay? It is fourth consecutive title fight for one. He's won all of them. He's finished all of them. As you just alluded to a moment ago, you know, obviously compared to other uh, promotions, especially in MMA, you you might say that one is not on the same level overall talent wise. And obviously he's only been with one for six fights. And before that, he he had uh, uh, eight other fights in other promotions, other smaller promotions, of course. But 14 and 0 is 14 and 0 and 14 finishes is 14 finishes. Have you considered where you would put Malik in, in your heavyweight rankings. I mean, or, I mean, he has three titles in three different weight classes, but where would you fit him in, in, in terms of the, the rankings that you, that as you see them in the UFC? Dude, I mean, it's, it's fairly impossible to, to say, because there's no points of comparison to like none of these guys that he has beaten outside of the, the only real one is Arjun Buller who did have uh, a short time in the UFC, wasn't able to do much. He he was kind of, I mean, it, he could have done more. They There was some contractual thing where they ended up just letting him go. But even so, he didn't make many waves when he was here. DeRitter's never fought any of these guys in, in Bellator and in PFL, or he, he's never crossed paths with any of these guys. So it's really hard to make a, a point of comparison. Like, mm-hmm. do I think he is a top 10 UFC heavyweight. I don't know that I'm ready to say that again, just simply because of the caliber of opponent. Do I think he could beat guys beyond that level? Yeah, probably. Like I think he's, he's, I mean, let's, let's who's, who's ranked heavyweights right now. Cause heavyweight ain't that deep. Um, I'm gonna be honest, man. If you, if I just thinking <clears throat> about the main event that happened this past weekend, I kind of think Malik can choose the two of them up, to be honest. You think he beats Rosenstrike, man? I do. I do. And and wow. And full full disclosure, we're gonna get to this fight. So it works with what I'm saying. 
Rosenstrike, actually, that's probably one of the better versions of Rosenstrike I've seen as far as a, a total game was concerned. You know, he didn't oh, get the again, we'll get there. But but I, I do say that not trying to shit on Rosenstrike. I thought that was a fantastic performance he had this weekend. I just think Malikin is just athletically. I just think he's better. Um, and I just think his his pace and his footwork allow him to walk dudes down and he can definitely beat uh Rosenstrike in a power of in a contest of power because that dude cracks to to me top of my head without him having proven anything more yet I think I'd be slotting him in around the bottom of the UFC rankings like toward that n- number 14 15 area area mm-hmm. I don't think I'm ready to say he's better than like a Jarzino or Rosenstrike but point is he we're debating it he may very well yep. be and it's as fans it's a little bit of a shame that we may not get this answer. I mean, how old is Anatoly Malikin while we're having this conversation quickly? That's a great question. 38. That's what oh, I thought. Wow. He's 36. Yeah, I, I thought he was up there. So we're, you know, he's this emergence is a, a little bit late. I mean, for a heavyweight, I guess it's not the end of the world. Um, and well, by Mike's standards, he's half dead. So, <laughs> <laughs> But to kind of blend into the idea of who he would fight next. This is sort of where I was going to go with this. It's like the the level that he has hit right now, taking out three of your champions, holding all these belts at once, and you made the decision to let him do it, to say, you know what? Yeah, I know you have two of our belts locked up. Put those on hold and go get a third. Like you allowed all this to happen if you're one. You have allowed him to become this like mega star over there. And you don't really have anyone ready for him to fight in any of these weight classes. Like I, Ali Akbari just just beat Arjun Buller on on this card. He's probably the number one contender at heavyweight now. Heavyweight's probably the easiest to sell, just because you're like, look at this huge guy that he has to go against. But like Malikin already knocked him out. Like he's there, there's not really anyone interesting. So I, I almost feel like their best course of action is to try to look outside the organization and set up some kind of super fight. We haven't really seen one do that. Obviously we've seen like Ryzen do that with their connection with Bellator. Now we have PFL and Bellator merging. So you never know what could come. Um, But it it just feels like there's nothing, or maybe one could sign someone who's, I'm trying to think who's even floating out there, like a Dos Santos or some shit like that. If you ever convince him to do it, Mm -hmm. like just for the name, but based on the guys on their roster, it doesn't feel like they have anyone who is even worth booking against Malikin right now. So it's, it's an odd scenario. Yeah, man. Omar, any other thoughts you want to contribute to that conversation? I mean, it's a valid point. Uh, I think his, his, you know, as much as we love one, the, the name value and the recognition that he's going to get there from the opponents that he has, is probably never going to get him to a place where, his resume will, I think, properly reflect where he should be in the MMA rankings, what I think he could potentially do against guys who are in the top of the world rankings, if you will, or the even you know UFC rankings, PFL rankings, that kind of deal. Um, I, I'm interested to see what, his, what, what the future looks like for Malikin, because obviously contracts eventually come to an end, but um, it would be interesting to see him against some of these top guys. He seems very married to one. Like yeah. he is in love with being in one. Sure. He, he, he says it constantly. So we'll totally. see how long one has, man. You know, those rumors are <laughs> haven't really gone away. You know what I mean? Yeah. They haven't gotten worse. But they haven't gone away. Yeah. But so. you know, you wonder if he thinks about what I just said. Like if they start coming to him with, How about you fight this guy? And he's like, Oh, that doesn't really seem so fun. So then you, you wonder if it, it'll happen for him where he's like, can you guys get me something better? You know, so, so people can see how good I am. So you're right. You never know how this develops. Yeah. yeah. So it's the second time that Malikin has faced Rainer de Ritter. And at both times, he has taken gold from RDR. RDR is going to call the cops and be like, somebody come arrest this man. He keeps <laughs> taking my stuff like a yeah. bully. Yeah, the shine shine comes off him a little bit of the man who used to say that he would uh, tap Adesanya if he had the chance. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Styles make fights. But that being yes. said, yes. Uh, in, in terms of that, yes, Anatoly Malikin definitely has a style that tops 
Rainer de Ritter. And uh, he's yeah. his daddy, man. He's his daddy. That being said, where does Anatoly Malkin go from here, Mark? What is, it, what is next for him? I mean, that's what we just talked through, was it not? Uh, uh, okay, fine. <laughs> All right. That being said, uh, let's move on to the co-main event of 166 in Qatar. In the featherweight division, Tang Kai gets it done over Tan Lee. By TKO in the third round, the official time, 448 of round three. Omar, or excuse me, Mark, start us off here. Give us your take of how this fight played out. Yeah, so Tom Lee did switch things up. I, I thought he might. He switched it up very obviously right away because he came out in southpaw. He, he took that lead leg away for Tang Kai to kick. Uh, since he tore it to pieces in their first fight. And it, it did take... Kai a little bit to adjust. You know, both guys got warned for inactivity early. Uh, you could tell each of them was kind of trying to figure out how they wanted to play things. And on that note, <clears throat> one is a little OD, man. Like, it's literally like, oh, and Tang Kai busts his nose open. Blood is leaking. You need to work. Like, what? Like, you know, like yeah. It's, they're yeah. Like, very all over them. It's, it's wild. Um, but yeah, he... Kai did a, good, a really good job of pressuring in this fight, of, of trying to cut Tan Lee off. Lee was kind of trying to play the opposite game of trying to invite him in a lot and, and looking to counter and then looking to rush forward with his typical blitzes like we always see from him. And he was having some success, but you got to give Kai credit, man. He, he is hard to hit. He sees shots so well. He rolls with them well. And God, he's so fast, uh, both in – and out of range in, in terms of how he's disappeared as Lee would be throwing strikes and also with his hands. And it was a combination of both of those things that led to the finish because he just stepped in with a lightning quick right hand. Lee didn't even really react to it and he just got dropped and he was dazed. Couldn't shake it off and had to eat a few more shots and, and that was it. So Tankai solidifies it 2-0 and now against Tan Lee and he is clearly the best featherweight in one. Omar, your thoughts of the fight? So I caught the ending of this fight. I did not watch the lead up to this fight or the lead up to the finish, I should say. Um, what I can tell you is that right hand that knocked Te uh, Tang Tan Lee. Tan Lee, Tan Lee, excuse me, Lee all the way out. That right hand had landed like five times before that. Yes. Yep. I mean, Homeboy didn't move his fucking face out of the way to literally save his life. He got hit multiple times and like clean with heavy hands, backed him into the fence, pushed him around. And then just the one just got through to a perfect spot. It was almost obviously like he was, you know, inching his way forward, calculating the shot by the fifth or sixth right hand in that sequence. I mean, it landed right on the button and just dropped him. I mean, his whole body just went right noodle on the floor. Agree. Uh, that's something that I picked up as well throughout this fight. I thought that, yeah, that, that right hand was landing. And in the third round, it was enough to put him out. And I thought that Tank Kai seemed to be having just a power and strength advantage over Tan Lee throughout the fight. He was, he was to me, evidently the stronger man. I think it was definitely a speed thing, man. It just looked like he didn't. Sure, that's true. It, it didn't look like he reacted when when Tang was throwing. Like it just, it almost like didn't register until the punch was basically by his face. You know what I mean? It. Yeah, he was just he, evidently he, slower. He looked a little slower than usual. Yeah. So moving this thing along, and uh, he's getting old, so it's not yeah. surprising. So that's back to back wins over Tan Lee has Tang Kai now a twelve fight win streak. Uh, as well, Mark, what is next for the reigning one featherweight? And by the way, just to remind our, our audience for one featherweight is 155 pounds. What is next for the reigning featherweight champ? Tank high. I think Gary Tonin has earned it, man. I, I, I know Tan Lee finished him a couple years ago, but he has won three straight since three straight submissions. He's nine and one overall. Obviously, he's a name. 
I think he deserves that shot. And I think that's a cool style clash between him and uh, Tank High. Nice. Omar, what do you think for the man whose record improves to 19-2, and two, now 8-0 and oh under the one banner? I just like to stick with Mark's decisions when it comes to one FC and Bellator. <laughs> I don't, I don't go deep on these rosters, man. It's a lot of dudes. I don't know what's happening over there. Okay. Last one we're going to talk about for one here. The was their first of three title fights in the straw weight division, another rematch. And Joshua, is it, I, I keep trying to think of how they said it, how uh, Ray Flores was saying it. Pacio. So Pacio. Yeah. There was one guy who was saying it like a sh. Usually, Pascio. I feel like I hear Pasio, but they one guy was saying Pasio. Well, because his nick his nickname is the Passion. Hmm. Uh, All right. Maybe I hear American people I say Pasio, and they don't know what they're talking Pascio. about. Pasio, Pasio. So Pasio, I guess. Uh, he defeats Jared Brooks by DQ because Jared Brooks, about not even a minute into the fight, That's savage. Jared Brooks was looking like he was on his way to another dominant performance using his wrestling. Uh, scrambles, gets Pascio's back, and then doesn't know the rule set for one uh, because he picks up he picks up Pascio. I mean, same in UFC. What's that? Same thing in UFC. Really? Not you can't spike a dude yeah, on no, top you of You can't head. you can't spike somebody on their head, man. Isn't that what happened to Thug Rose? No, that was no, it wasn't the same because Rose was holding on to Jessica. Where it was here, yeah. But oh, even really? still, that wasn't that was Rose could have let go and she would have been fine. I wouldn't sure. DQ Jessica yeah. for this. This one, this crazy asshole had this poor man <laughs> locked up super tight. That dude wasn't going nowhere <laughs> yeah, and man. just smashed his head right into the ground. I mean, it looked was, real bad. I mean, it looked real bad. Yeah, it's it one of the it really one of the did. worst slams on a head you'll you'll see in a fight. I'm, I'm really really glad that Joshua Pasio is okay uh yeah. in terms of his his head and his neck and his spine. Uh that being I'm said, honest, when it happened, I was yeah. like, "Oh, one's crazy. I didn't know this was allowed." And then No, and yeah. then it wasn't. <laughs> I mean, it's that's reasonable to assume because one allows knees and kicks to the head, right? On the to yeah. ground opponents. Yeah, yeah, right. True. Okay, Mark, give us your impressions. Not a ton to react to here, but for the less than a minute that this fight transpired, what, what were your thoughts on how it played out and how it ended? Yeah, it was tough for Jared Brooks, man. I mean, you know, it's 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 the right call. You can't spike someone on their head, and he, and he did. But obviously, he didn't do it intentionally. It, it's just the way that it happened. He even, when Herb said it to him, he's like, no, I didn't. I dropped him on his shoulder, like, watch the thing. And Herb was like, oh, we're going to watch the thing. And Obviously, it didn't go so well. Dude, Herb was on it. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, it's tough for him because he was looking great early. You know, he's so fast, had a beautiful back take. Of course, this monster slam. And then he thinks he won by knockout and he's celebrating. And then there's a lot of emotions that he ended up having to work through there. And his belt is obviously gone. It's going back back to Pascio on a, on a DQ. So it's a pretty wild outcome. Um, you would assume we're going to have to do this a third time, if they gave yep. Pascio a rematch from the first one, they're certainly going to have to give Brooks a rematch after a DQ. But yeah, tough, tough result, and hopefully Pascio's okay. Omar, any other thoughts on that? I don't want to be that guy, but okay. like I feel like I have to mention it because when you when you fail a smell test somewhere, I feel like you got to say something, right? And they're just there's just some tickles, right? Like, what are you talking like, about? I feel like Jared Brooks might have been on some shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> what are you talking about? Jared Brooks looked all the way amped up in there. Like, he did four or five pre workout scoops deep kind of shit. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, totally. Like, he was on something, man. So that's number one. And then the rapid emotional decline, just messing with the, you know, I just, you know what I mean? Just, Gives me a little tickle there. I'm not, I'm not trying to say anything, but it just the smell test for me just didn't work out. That's all. People say this about Malikin too. There, one has a lot. People raise a lot of questions about what's going on in one. That that rage though that that monkey god had, just yeah. a lot of rage yeah. in that boy. I mean, he's the monkey god. He rages. Is that a monkey Holy king? Holy shit! Monkey king. Too much rage. No monkey. No monkey god. Isn't it? It's the monkey god. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Not the monkey king. 
It is the monkey god. No, no. Okay. But yeah, tough one for him. It sure is, man. It sure is. Uh, so I guess we're not really need to, we don't really need to say like, oh, what's next for Joshua Pasio because they're most likely going to run this back, right? You would have to imagine. Yeah. Okay, and that doesn't... Josh, you would think, is like, I don't feel like the champion. I'm going to need to try this again. Totally, totally. It's not not the way I want to win, right? Not the way I want to win the belt back. Yeah. Um, I guess that does it for our recap of 1-166. Um, But to your point before, Marcus, I want to say real quick, you're absolutely right that one is on something with the pushing the pace. I feel like Herb Dean is like a different Herb Dean watching him referee a one fight. Yeah, like you, you watch Herb ref UFC, and he's like the most laid back guy. But in one, he's like, "You gotta, go, you have to engage," and he's not like occasionally reminding them. He's like no. on them. Yeah, you know what I think it is. I think it might be Omar. Do you think it's the like the Muay Thai influence? Because one is a, also a major promoter of Muay Thai, and that basically is the what would you say like the ethos of Muay Thai, like Muay Thai pressure and aggression and moving forward is like the hallmark of Muay Thai. Like it's, and it's not that you're not allowed to evade or move back, but you're docked points for that. Are you not in Muay Thai for like evading you're a lot? Do- you're docked points for inactivity for sure. Um, I don't know, man. I, I, it's very possible that their rule, cause their rule set is obviously somewhat unique, right? They do their own thing. They're not using unified oh, rules. Sure. Um, so it's very possible that their specific rule set on inactivity and yellow card usage and that kind of stuff is just very specific to them. And maybe that's why Herb Dean acts the way he acts because he's just yeah. following the guidelines of their rules. Oh, totally. Yeah. 100%. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he it, able, if he was able to whip out yellow cards in the UFC, I'm sure he'd do it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if this is the episode given our time tonight and the amount we have to get through, but. Just to touch on it real quick, whenever I watch one, I, I have to say I am I am tickled by the whole yellow card and red card thing, and I kind of like it. I'd love to. Um, like curious what you guys think of it. You don't like it? Oh no, I don't. I, there might be a happy middle ground. Yeah, like they will literally like like he throws a left, he throws a right, they reset. Uh, yellow card. Like. <laughs> Oh well, yeah, dude. I thought that about the um the Arjun Buller fight, which was right before the the Pasho Brooks fight, and like Herb, I was like, dude, if this was a UFC fight, it would just be like, man, Arjun Buller is having a hard time figuring out how to fight this giant. Yeah, but Herb yeah. was like, don't care if he is a giant. That's your problem to figure out, not mine. Even the announcers, like I felt like the Kai Lee fight was like pretty solid action. Like if we were describing that fight as a UFC fight, we would have been like, yeah, like pretty active fight. And and the announcers are like, man, every time Lee moves forward, Kai just moves back. And every time Kai moves forward, Lee just moves back. And it's like, well, like, what do you want them to fucking do? Like, they're right. not going to stand there and get hit. Like, right, right. I don't it's know. True. I don't. I don't love it. Okay. 